So you know how um, after Occupy Wall Street, the establishment started talking about white supremacy and racism and making you hate because they can't have us come together because we came together. The Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, we were both angry at Wall Street and the establishment. We wanted change in this country. So they they realized how to separate us is by constantly talking about identity politics and race and race and race and race. And, race, and that's all. Even though racism has gone down. Uh, they want to make it, make you think it's the biggest thing in the world. And this guy wrote a book debunking that, and he went on The View. And here we go. First question that I should... My first question is, is that a whoopee mullet? I think that's what that... Should we call that a whoopee mullet? <laughs> I think we can. I just want to coin that. I certainly hope viewers don't start hashtagging that everywhere. That would be terrible. The whoopee mullet hashtag. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Ask you to 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 do is explain to folks what you mean. I, that that's got to frighten children. That haircut. <laughs> There's got that's got like, huh? Is there a monster coming? Because that's what. Here we go. Mm. By this, she looks like an outer space villain. She looks like a like a villain you would an, you would encounter in outer space. That's what I would think. Okay, here we go. Like some from Battlestar Galactica. That's what the villain would look like. Arguments for a colorblind America. What do you mean when you say that? So a lot of people equate colorblindness to I don't see race or mm -hmm. to pretending not to see race. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big mistake. We all see race, mm -hmm. right? Oh, I'm sorry. His name is Coleman Hughes. I don't know. I call him Colin Rugg. That's, that's a different guy. <laughs> Uh, his name is Coleman Hughes. Sorry. Yes, you did. And we're all capable of being racially biased, so we should all be self-aware to that possibility. My argument is not for that. My argument is that we should try our very best to treat people without regard to race, both in our personal lives and our public policy. Of course. And the reason I wrote this book, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sounds like the audience of The View agrees with this guy. Guess who doesn't agree with this guy? All the ladies on The View. Here we go. The, reason I wrote the, la the ladies on The View cannot afford this level of harmony that he proposes because <laughs> they are all about the elite othering. You don't need the people on The View if everyone's getting along. Here we go. Watch. The book is because in the past 10 years, it has be become very popular to, in the name of anti-racism, mm -hmm. teach a kind of philosophy to our children and in general that says your race is everything. Right. And I think that is the wrong way to fight racism. And that's why I wrote this book at this time. Can I I'm sorry, baby. Yeah. Can I just point out that there is a reason for that? You know, when I went to school, getting any information about anyone's race was not taught no <coughs> history. There was no black history. None of those things were taught. And here in America, 100 years ago, when I was a young woman, <laughs> that's how people saw you. That's how they judged you. So. I think it's, it, she's literally talking about 60 years ago when she went, she was in school. That's how what old she, is she? She's 68 years old. She's talking about over 60, so 60 years ago. Okay. I don't want to say it's the, your youth, but I think you have a, point but i think you have to also take into consideration what people have lived through in order to understand why there has been such a, a, a pointing of very specific racial things like women couldn't go to get into colleges if you are a black person there are a lot of colleges wouldn't accept you trying to equal the playing field i think that's what a lot of folks were have been trying to do i'm sure, sorry i didn't sure. mean to cut you off. i think that's your experience and, and that's valid you know as a counterpoint mm -hmm. when i was in fifth grade we all watched roots mm -hmm. together yeah in, in public school yeah so these are different experiences i yes. th i think it's also different generations mm -hmm. it's different parts of the country mm -hmm. right we have very different cultures all living together in one yes. country so i'm not going to deny that but i think i view this notion of a colorblind society similar to the idea of a peaceful society which is to say it's an ideal it's a north star mm -hmm. and the point is not that we're ever going to get there we're not going to touch it but we have to know when we're going forward and when we're going backwards and we're going backwards when we're doing woke kindergarten in san francisco uh, you know with with you didn't hear about this story no you know but wait, 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 wait. oh my god 
That's not what they wanted to this hear. This is not what they want to hear. But isn't this the message of Dr. Martin Luther King this Jr.? His, not to judge me by the co- color, color of my, my skin, but the, the content skin. of my character? So they get to that. They push back on that. You're no. not gonna, you're not going to believe this. Watch this. So watch this. I think it's they, part yeah, of the book. Yeah, okay, you actually you yeah. believe that public policies that address socioeconomic differences would be better at benefit, benefiting disadvantaged groups and that race-based policies often hurt the very people they're trying to help. So this is what we've been saying at this show that this is about class. This isn't a, this isn't about bl- so instead of you know when Cornell West comes on and he stresses uh, the trans brothers and sisters and LGBTQ and white supremacy that doesn't get you anywhere. You know what does? If everybody comes together and advocates for Medicare for all and everybody has health care that doesn't bankrupt us, that helps everybody. That helps LGBTQ, trans, black, white, at, br- everybody. So that's that's what do you think that um, Christian Smalls led with all that stuff when he or organized he led on class lines. You organize along class lines. That's what scares the establishment. That's what works because that's what works. If you want to keep doing identity politics, that's there to keep us divided. If you want to make everybody identify with their race and their ethnicity and their skin color and their sexuality, that's there to divide us. That comes from the top down. And the people who still do that don't realize that. Their heart might be in the right place. It's not productive. And you have to come at this from class lines. That's the only thing that works. And it's the only thing that scares them. Okay. What are some some examples of policies that would be better at reducing uh, racial disparities? So my overall argument is that class, socioeconomics, is a better proxy for disadvantage. We all want to help the disadvantaged, and the question is, how do we identify them, right? The default right now in a, in, in a lot of areas of policy is to use you know, black and Hispanic identity as a proxy for disadvantage, and my argument is that you actually get a better picture of who needs help by looking at socioeconomics right. and, and income. Mm-hmm. That, that picks out people in a more accurate way. Yeah. Right. So, Again, it sounds like their audience agrees with this guy. Yeah. Stop separating people and, and and identifying people by their color of their skin. And let's start addressing problems on a socioeconomic level and a class level, because that helps everybody. If everybody gets a living wage, that helps all people. So that's been my whole point all along. We got to be able to come together to get stuff that we all agree on. First, and he's right about this. Let's watch. This, this and, is not my ahead. question, but when you say that uh, socioeconomics picks out people in a better way than mm-hmm. race, mm-hmm. when you do look at the socioeconomics, you see the huge disparity between white households and black households. You see the huge disparity between white households and Hispanic households. So your argument, and I've read your book twice because I wanted to give it a chance. I don't agree. Um, your don't, argument don't, don't, that race has... I'm going to challenge the veracity of her reading that book twice. And uh, she's also descended from slave owners, just in, case, just in case you know. No place in that equation is really fundamentally flawed in my no, opinion. No, uh, well, there's two separate questions. One is whether each racial group is socioeconomically the same. That, well, the, I agree with you. The, they're the, not. The, yeah, of they're course. not. And the stats the question is, show that. But the, yeah, of course. I agree with that fully. The question is, how do you how do you address that in the way that actually targets poverty the best? Great. And what Martin Luther King wrote in his book, Why We Can't Wait, mm-hmm. is he called it, we need a bill of rights for the disadvantaged. Mm-hmm. And he said, yes, we should address racial inequality. Yes, right. we should address the legacy of slavery. But the way to do that is on the basis of class. And that will disproportionately target blacks and Hispanics because they're disproportionately poor, but it will be doing so in a way that also helps the white poor, in a way that addresses poverty as the thing to be addressed. That part is true. So we, when we had on that woman um, talked about the professional managerial class, she made the point that the, mo- the, uh, the, the greatest group of poor people in America are white. And so what he just said is, you, is if, you, if you go after socioeconomic conditions, it actually ends up helping black and brown people. That's what you want to do, right? But it also helps poor white people. True, but as you are a student of Dr. King, I'm not only a student of Dr. King, I know his daughter, Bernice. Oh, so she's, she's, you better watch it. I know, I, so that is a, 
logical fa- fallacy. She is now. She, I have more credibility than you because I know his daughter. Can okay, I, can I that's just an tell appeal you to authority. Something that I'm noticing with the women on the View that if you're talking to them and they go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. Mm-hmm. They are totally going to push back the next moment. They're not there to concede or agree with you. They're just waiting for their moment to like get right in and, and correct you. So here we go. Right. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm going to get to my question. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Um, uh, I think the premise is fundamentally flawed. You, you claim that uh, colorblindness was the goal of the civil rights movement mm-hmm. based upon Dr. King's I have a dream speech, you know, content of character versus the um, color of skin. <laughs> Bernice, Dr. King's daughter, points out that four years after giving that speech, actually, um, Dr. King also said this. A society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for Negroes. He also said in 1968, it was about less than a week before he was assassinated. This country never stops to realize that they owe a people kept in slavery for 244 years. So rather than class, he did write about that earlier on, right before his death, he made the argument for racial equality and racial reparations. And so your argument for colorblindness, I think, is something that the right has co-opted. And so many in the black community, if I'm being honest with you, because <laughs> I want to be, believe that you are being used as a pawn her? by the right and that you're a charlatan of sorts. He's, he's not a Republican. Well, so how do you, who, who, he's never voted well, for you, a you, 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 you said that you're a conservative. So she just called him a charlatan. And she's going to backtrack on that going forward. She's going to pretend like those weren't her words. But that's, that's her. This is her talking. Okay. No, you, no. No. No, you did. You actually said that uh, in the <coughs> podcast that you did two weeks ago. I said I was a conservative. He's not. Yes, he's not, yes you did. So, but my question to you, my question to you is, how do you respond okay. to those critics? Okay, let's believe. give it a okay, so so answer. Yes, first thing I want I, I think it's very important. The quote that you just pointed out, about doing something special for the Negro. That's from the book, Why We Can't Wait, that that I just mentioned. Yes. A couple paragraphs later, he lays out exactly what that something special was, and it was the Bill of Rights for the Disadvantaged, a broad class-based policy. But he also says you must include race. (laughs) No, he didn't. He says it's a... Yes, he does. Okay, well, everyone can go... Everyone should go read the book, Why We Can't Wait. Let's not get sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've been co-opted by anyone. I've only voted twice, both for Democrats, Mm -hmm. although I'm an independent. I would vote for a Republican, mm-hmm. probably a non-Trump Republican, if they were compelling. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's any evidence I've been co-opted by anyone, and I think that that's, that's a, an ad hominem tactic people use to not address really the important conversations we're having here. And I, I think it's better, and it would be better for everyone if we stuck to the topics rather than but make it about a, me but with no, about no you, evidence but I, that I've been co I want to give you the opportunity to respond yeah, to the... I, I appreciate your, it. No, no, no. That, that, that's not what you did. You called him a charlatan. And you said that you think the premise is fundamentally flawed and you're being used by the right wing and you're a charlatan. And now she's saying, I'm giving you the opportunity to respond because he just cleaned your fucking clock. The criticism. I appreciate it. There's no evidence that I've been co-opted by anyone. I have an independent podcast. Mm -hmm. I work for CNN as an analyst. Mm -hmm. I write for the free press. I'm independent in all of these endeavors and no one is paying me to say what I'm saying. I'm saying it because I feel it. Alyssa. You have the. So let me just remind people that at the end of his life, Martin Luther King did. Did he do a black people's march on Washington? Oh, no. It was a poor people's march on Washington. That's what he was doing. And that is what's actually threatening to the establishment. That when he included everybody and he uh, organized along class lines that's what's actually threat. No matter what the fuck you think, no matter how true your grievances are, the only thing that scares the establishment and works is organizing along class lines. The poor people's March is what Martin Luther King did. Not the poor black people's March. Well, you know what? I just want to say that he says that he's independent. His podcast is independent, unlike who he's speaking to right now. They all work for a for major the, broadcasting the establishment. network, right. Disney and ABC. That's right. 
Coleman, thanks for being here. So in the past decade, it feels like racial tensions have gotten worse. Um, do you see it that way and what do you attribute uh, it to? Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you look at all the data, it finds that racial race relations were getting better until about 2013. And so when was that? That was right after Occupy Wall Street. And, and if they've done studies about this. Of course, you'll never see this talked about on mainstream news. But what happened then was the establishment in their uh, and their corporate media then started pushing division through racial politics, started talk the mentions of racism, white supremacy uh, went through the roof starting in 2013. That's what he's talking. Now, he doesn't for some reason, he doesn't know the origin of that. Or maybe he hasn't seen those studies because they try to keep them hidden. But that's the that's the fact. And that's the what the establishment class is using to keep us from organizing along class lines. And that happened after Occupy Wall Street. And it scared the shit out of them. And that's what they've been doing ever since. And Donald Trump is such a gift to them. And the fact that they could rehabilitate uh, Jim Crow Joe Biden as some kind of fighter for racial justice is just goes to show you how good propaganda works. So I'll let him answer this question. That year, you had a majority of black, Hispanic, and white Americans saying race relations were good. And then you just see it. Look at that. The majority of everybody was saying it's good. And then it just sky, Then it just went the other way. I wonder why. Because of the reason I just told you. Nosedive. And 2013, it, you know, people like to blame, Republicans like to blame Obama. It wasn't his fault. <laughs> Democrats like to blame Trump. It, it was actually just technology. We all got social media and smartphones, and we had videos being promoted in the algorithm that were unrepresentative, and it created this impression that racism was on the rise when, in fact, it had been on the decline for decades. And it Do allowed you attribute everybody. that at all to foreign actors? Get oh, it's Russia. Foreign actors? No, that's being done by people in the United States. You guys are doing it right now. Yeah, their show is one of the Your people show that is doing this. it. Right now, you're all doing it. No, we have to make class the first and foremost. We have to make race the thing. That's You're doing it. And this is the only part he kind of flubs. He kind of gives in. Involved in technology. Uh, yes, Russia tries to meddle, absolutely. But I think I don't think we can blame foreign actors. This is a homegrown problem. Okay. I have he, a question. And he gets it right. This is, a, this, is, this is coming from, again, when he says homegrown, people think, oh, because of my, my neighbor's racist. No, because the media that controls you wants you to think your neighbors are more racist than they are. They wanted you to think that people hated each other more than they do to divide us. Just like he said in 2013, you asked has black Hispanics, well, people said they were everything was going good as far as race relations. We just elected a black guy president for the second time. Overwhelmingly. You know, when I'm watching this, I remember just watching the View interview Schumer, Chuck Schumer. No pushback ever. No holding him right, accountable for this anything. Guy, this, but this guy's trouble. This guy, they're up in his shit. Yeah. Because you write that the anti-racism movement. There are a couple By the way, oh, so now here comes a uh, person of color, Joy Behar, to quiz him about racism. Come on, paste, pasty white. That's a color. <laughs> She's wearing her designer yeah. hoodie. Here we go. Yes. People, I don't even know who they are. Maybe you know Robin D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo, yeah. Ibram Kendi, for instance. Okay. Well, they, uh, you say that that is just a form of another form of racism, and you even say it has a lot in common with white supremacy. How can you compare those two things? You, I you talk about anti-racism. You're comparing it to white supremacy. Because they they both view your race as a. a extremely significant part of who you are. So r r white supremacists, they obviously say, we all know what they say, okay? Uh, Neo-racists like Rob D'Angelo, they say that to be white is to be ignorant, for example. Well, uh -huh. this is a racial stereotype, and I want to call a spade a spade and say this is not the style of anti-racism we have to be teaching our kids. We should be teaching them that your race is not a significant feature of you, who you are. Who you are is your character, your value, and your skin color doesn't say anything about that. Right. Wow. Again. So at least the audience, at least their audience can get gets it, but they don't. They're not getting it. So again, this this whole thing of uh well, we showed you the prosecutor for Trump, Letitia James, say that Trump is too male, too pale, and too stale. So she's being a sexist, she's being a racist, and that kind of racism is what he's pushing back against. That's destructive. It takes us backwards. It puts your race first and foremost instead of the content of your character. 
actually misrepresenting so, what, what Robin DiAngelo's yeah. position it's is. It's in her book. But well, a lot, that's a lot, not, so here we go. Here we go. Thank you, Coleman Hughes, for coming. Because this is a show of lots of different opinions. And mm -hmm. we are multi-generational. And we all got an opinion. Yeah. So the end of race politics arguments for a colorblind America is out now. And so there it is. The end of race politics. Man, they ganged up on him like he was trying to get initiated into a Ukraine fraternity. For fuck's sake. <laughs> he took it like a champ or at least a guy who grew up with a lot of sisters. How about that? <laughs> So here, uh, I just got some random people on uh, Twitter who... Re so this uh, Monica Harris, she's executive director of the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Uh, she's a TEDx speaker dedicated to uniting humanity and overcoming the illusion of division. Uh, Monica Harris, she looks African-American. She says, oh my God, you knocked it out of the park on The View. Props for your uncanny ability to convey in a manner more compelling than anyone I've seen why a colorblind society is the true path to racial equality, harmony, and the f and the fair and just world that Martin Luther King envisioned for all Americans. Uh, Monica Osborne says, it must have been maddening for such a thoughtful and intelligent man to be holding court with people who don't know what they're talking about, <laughs> some of whom were clearly just looking for a fight. When someone goes off script when talking about racism, these people melt down. Still, glad he was able to express some of his ideas to a mainstream audience. Here is uh, uh, Morgan Freeman talking to Mike Wallace. History month you find ridiculous. Why? You're going to relegate my history to a month? Oh, come well, on. What do you do with yours? What, which month is white history month? <laughs> no, well, no, no, come on, tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay, which I'm month Jewish. is Jewish history month? Uh, there isn't one. Oh. oh. Boy, who better to straighten Morgan Freeman out about race than Mike Wallace? <laughs> Was Larry Bird not available? <laughs> Justin Bieber on the road? When in doubt, maybe we should call in Michael Rappaport to talk street with the African-American community. Here we go. Why not? Yeah. Do you want one? No, no, no. I, 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 I don't either. Ah. I don't want a Black History Month. Black history is American history. Yes. How are we going to get rid of racism? And stop still... talking about it. Ah. I'm going to stop calling you a white man. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you to stop calling me a black man. I know you as Mike Wallace. You know me as Morgan Freeman. You black history so that's all that's the only clip of that that's as that's as long as i can find it but there you go and so what did the establishment do they did the exact opposite they kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and starting in 2013 because that was their response to occupy wall street and people coming together that's what is happening and i love what tim dillon says about the view engineered the view because there's nothing worse than the view in terms of like, there are so many brilliant women out there. None of them are on The View. <laughs> <laughs> and I just want to remind you the kind of mindset that The View has. This is, this is just another example of the uh, regressive ridiculousness that... That sh here, watch, watch. So there's this clip going viral online of a dozen women being asked the following question. Do we need men? <laughs> Most answered very quickly, no. So why do you think that is? Because men are useless. Broadly speaking, I feel like men have proven largely useless, like I think in the political moment. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> love it. And by the way, I wanted I want to differentiate between straight men and gay men, because I think I, I would die without gay men. <laughs> Excuse me. So now this guy, this is a comedy bit. So now this is his comedy part. Got it. The ABC network, which is hosting this show, would have canceled the show if it were a panel of men saying that women are useless. I see the producer right there. I wonder what you think about this one. Look at that. Y'all would have called them misogynists and the media would have destroyed the lives of those men. That's something to reflect on. And aside from that, everything you just said were emotional responses, but that's to be expected from a low IQ panel. <laughs> so, 
Notice that it's not called the views. It's called the view, singular. There's no room for a second opinion at that table. The only variation they allow is doing something different with your hair. <laughs> They're more concerned with coloring inside the lines than they are with skin mm-hmm. color. I'll mm-hmm. tell you that. The view is dog training. And guess what? We're the dogs. Here's uh, here's one more. Uh, so he's, she was talking about that passage that um, Sonny was talking about in that Melton Luther King book. And she says, what this passage proves is that Martin Luther King embraced the concepts of affirmative action and reparations. He understood that without economic opportunity, there could be no true equality. However, towards the end of his life, he appreciated that the systemic inequities of class were plaguing a growing segment of black and white America. Hence his decision to stage the poor people's march in the final months of his life, which was not confined to people of color, but included poor white Americans. As that guy on The View said, the biggest driver of inequality now is class, not race. But economics is not the context in which Martin Luther King supported colorblindness. He wanted our human connection to be colorblind. He envisioned a society in which we recognized race but did not judge or treat one another differently because of it. He would not have advocated that black students be separated from white students in affinity groups or taught in black only classes because that's just deep. That's just debranded segregation. You can't fight segregation with segregation. Martin Luther King was a staunch advocate of integration. He would be appalled by what is happening in our schools because racializing our human experience ultimately separates us by emphasizing our differences versus our common experiences and values. Don't forget that Martin Luther King also said, I'm convinced that men hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other, and they don't know each other because they don't communicate with each other, and they don't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. Defining humans as racial beings will drive separation and ultimately breed hate. When there is hate, there can be no equality. This is the most definitely not what Martin Luther King wanted. And here's what a white guy, Matt Taibbi, said. He said, our differences are beautiful, but it was a long battle to eliminate policy distinction based on race and to begin to try to see ourselves as equal members of a common humanity. These people from The View would undo all of that hard work. And here's Sunny when she found out that she was descended from slave owners. You want to see it? Let's watch. Wow. I'm, I'm a little bit in shock. I, I just always thought of myself as Puerto Rican, you know, half Puerto Rican. <laughs> I didn't think I was, uh, my family was originally from Spain and slaveholders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how are you feeling, my friend? <laughs> um, I just, um, I think it's actually pretty interesting that, um, my husband and I have shared roots. Yeah. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I think it's great for our children mm-hmm. to know this information. Um, I guess it's a fact of life that uh, this is how some people made their living on the backs of others. Wow. So anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed that segment. Uh I I can't wait to get that guy's book and read it, and I hope I get a chance to interview him. Yeah. Hey, there's still tickets available in Stockholm, Oslo, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, Cortland, New York, Oakmont, Pennsylvania, El Paso, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, Edmonton, Alberta, Vancouver, British Columbia, Denver, Ashland, Virginia, and Athens, Georgia. See you there. Mm-hmm.